Well, hello. Uh, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. I am actually recording as I'm getting ready to run out of my office here in New York. Uh, say hello to New York City. There you go. I did this for you a couple weeks ago. This represents the view out of the office. There you have looking out on the 57th Street out in Central Park. Quite a few tall buildings there. I'm not really trying to be a cameraman, but there you go. Um, that's I've been here in New York for three weeks now and done a lot of talking in the last three weeks about dividend growth investing, a lot of client meetings, a lot of money manager meetings, and uh, I'm heading back with my family tonight, and I'm literally am running out the door. Uh, so I'm going to do this kind of quick today, but there's a lot to cover. Uh, as always, let me remind you, the dividendcafe.com has the whole entire commentary, and I think it's a pretty full one this week, and there is an abnormally high amount of charts. I don't even know if it's an abnormally high amount. There's maybe five charts, but I think they're really meaty. I think they're really fruitful and will help really pull together a lot of the content of this week's Dividend Cafe and the message that I want to share. I'm um, leaving New York for the uh, because uh, I'm done here with what I've needed to do. I've had a microphone in my face quite a bit talking about dividend growth. And now I'm going to continue talking about dividend growth. Uh, but the microphone won't be in my face. I'm kind of done with all that stuff I did around the book. And um, the book that I wrote about different growth investing captures something I've been talking about for 20 years or so, and we'll be talking about for 20 years more. So those principles embedded in the concept of dividend growth investing and the uh, merits of cash flow generative investments and, and the principles behind that kind of fundamental and value-oriented approach to risk asset investing um, I've enjoyed talking about it with this kind of audience over the last couple of weeks, but it's something that, you know, I'm quite accustomed to talking to with the people I most care about, which of course are my clients. And it's something we're going to continue doing and executing upon and, and uh, actively managing till kingdom come. Uh, this week in the markets, we're actually down a couple hundred points right now here on Thursday morning. It had been up and, and flat throughout the week, uh, pretty benign week overall, really good environment in April so far. Uh, we still have a few days to go to the month ends. But what you're going to, uh, what I'm going to cover right now rather is that the reason, I mean, indisputably, I think the reason markets have done well in April is that the earnings season has indeed gone well. And even before it started, the revisions of what people are expecting out of earnings results have already begun to slope upward. And that's continued, and we're now at a point where 45% of companies have moved their earnings expectation higher, and with 36% of companies having reported results for first quarter, is now appearing to be that we may end up ending the first quarter with flat earnings growth year over year, not having any kind of a contraction, let alone one projected for the full year. So one of the largest talking points of negativity is mostly off the table for the remainder of, of uh, 2019 in theory. Uh, of course, that's subject to change at any time. But it does explain why there's a sort of renewed confidence in markets as earnings, uh, which ultimately drive markets, appear to be doing so much better. So again, with only 36% having reported, I'm not going to dive too deeply into how we expect this whole season to end other than what I've already shared. Um, there has been some misses, and there's been a lot of uh, really nice stories that have come out. Uh, overall forward guidance for the full year, though, has really been quite positive. That's the That sets the table for the bulk of the earnings environment we're in. Um, so that's been the driver of markets. It's what will probably keep markets, uh, we can stay the driver and stay the predominant factor in markets for at least the next uh, week or two weeks. Then you get to the kind of tail end of earnings season, and we see where things go. Now, this week, a couple of political events, of course, at the end of last week, the Mueller report came out. Markets shrugged it off entirely. I think most of the country has largely shrugged it off, other than, obviously, there's certain things that understandably give people who don't like the president even more fodder to not like him. People who really, really like the president have more fodder to really, really like him. And I think um, it's unlikely that it changed many minds about things. So not only is a, a non-story market-wise, but you could even argue not a whole lot of a story around the politics of it, not moving a lot of dials and things like that. Speaking of moving dials, well, Vi former Vice President Joe Biden entering the race, 
potentially move any dials in this Democratic campaign, will Democratic primary, we will see. I don't suspect that it will right away. I think that uh, he's just on name recognition. We know he's going to be amongst the top of the field if first, if not second, until you know you get deeper into things. Um, I don't really believe the idea that he's actually the centrist and moderate in the race. Uh, you know, he's Joe, Vice President Biden is a reasonably left wing guy, but I guess relative to the other candidates, you, you know, you could argue that he's uh, not quite, at least historically, has not been quite as uh, left wing as them, which sort of, in a relative sense, make, allows for the use of that word centrist. But economically and market impact, it's impossible to kind of project a lot of those things until we get deeper into things. So we'll see how his polling and how his fundraising goes in the weeks ahead. And I do plan to do more on the primary as we get deeper into it. Um, but, you know, until you get near to where the debates start and things, it really most of the stuff trades, to use an investment term, off of name recognition. So it's early. So I am going to... Um, kind of tell you a couple other things that, uh, for you watching the video still uh, about the alternative investment world. And and the reason not only uh, that I'm bringing this up is because it is a big focus of ours. It's a heavy area of our um, uh, attention at the Bonson Group and a part of our portfolio management process. Um, markets, you know, where they are, uh, you look for those different things that uh, create some degree of diversification in your portfolio. And across the hedge fund space, I have a chart at Dividend Cafe this week that shows the beta, the equity beta of a lot of hedge funds increasing higher, still much lower, you know, obviously than a full stock portfolio, but um, may, way higher than we would want our alternative investment allocation to be. And we work very hard to have a lower beta because the thing we're trying to solve for is lower correlation to equity markets. Uh, look, beta can perform great. If all, uh, but the whole point is it's an alternative then. If what you're trying to accomplish is non-correlation, you want lower beta, not higher. And I think a lot of hedge funds are not succeeding in that. And another thing a lot of hedge funds are not succeeding in is just that result itself. And the dispersion, there's a chart on this as well, the dispersion of results uh, with a gap between really high-performing uh, strategies and low-performing strategies in private equity and hedge funds and real estate is significant, much more than in public equity markets where that dispersion may be a bit lower. So, so in both uh, points, the results and the beta correlation to equity markets, the selection ma matters a lot. The due diligence, uh, the process, the ongoing monitoring, the implementation of alternative strategy matters. It is not just a, a selection of an asset class, that will deliver the result. And and I think that's very different than a lot of traditional investing decisions. And so that's why I bring it up. Some good content on that there this week. For real estate investors, um, correlations between equities can be very low during normalized periods, but during recessions generally skyrocket higher and equities and real estates during recessionary times have a very high correlation. There's one exception, and that was the recession, a very small minor recession we had after the dot-com bust and after 9-11, uh, where uh, real estate performed very well and equities did not. But if you look at four or five other recessions of the last you know, total five or six we've had, uh, the correlation between real estate and equities has been very high. So you have to look at that one from nearly 20 years ago and say, well, what was the difference? And of course, the difference was that's where the things that were the kindling for what became the financial crisis, the housing bubble, was really taking hold. Unbelievably low interest rates, unbelievable access to credit, total collapse of any standards and underwriting, heavy securitization of mortgage-backed securities. So those things were enabling real estate to really continue advancing and, and actually setting the table for real estate to end up crashing a number of years later. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there, primarily because of time constraints and me needing to go catch an airplane. Uh, do go to DividendCafe.com this week. We uh, hope that you have enjoyed this brief video and we will be bringing you a more extended one next week. Maybe I say that every week. I don't know. It seems like I do. Um, uh, but hopefully this content has been succinct and, and informative for you. And please do reach out with questions anytime and give us a review, share it around, subscribe however you're watching this, all that kind of stuff. Thanks very much.
for viewing, watching, listening to The Dividend Cafe.